Today, we have uh, implementing IPAs, Integrated Performance Assessments in University Foreign Language Teaching, with people from both Spanish and uh, the German department. Angela Carlson Lombardi, front. Beth Kautz, sitting next to her. Liz Lake, and Helena Ruff, who will start. Yes. Is this on? It is on. Okay. Just put the little clip. Let's see if I can work this. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Elaine. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. We'll be careful with it. Okay. So I'm going to start with a simple question today, and that is what is an IPA exactly? And sadly, I'm not going to be talking about the beer today, but instead, I'm going to be talking about a, yeah, the beer is good too. Um, I'm going to be talking about a three-part integrated activity assessing language skills in all three modes of communication. So inter interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. Students receive a grade and feedback on each part before moving on to the next part. And the information learned in one section will be used for the other sections. And here's a helpful diagram that illustrates the stages or the three parts of an IPA. So the students begin again with the interpretive communication phase and here students would listen to and or read an authentic text and then answer informational as well as interpretive questions assessing their comprehension. Then the teacher provides the students with feedback on their performance and then they move on to the interpersonal communication phase. Um, where they would have a con conversation with a partner on a particular topic which relates back to the topic of the interpretive text. And this phase is usually audio or videotaped. And then after receiving feedback on this section, they would move into the presentational phase where students would somehow share their results or opinions or ideas that they've gathered thus far in one of many different formats, a speech, a skit, a podcast, a blog post, something like that. There are many different ways to do it. And it's, IPAs don't have to move in this one, two, three interpretive interpersonal presentational order. You can do things differently. For example, you could have the presentational phase be before the interpersonal phase or something like that. Um, to illustrate this even further, I'm gonna briefly describe an IPA we are currently using in German 1002 and also I guess in German 1022. Um, the students are told that they are studying abroad in Germany that's the context, and they want to go to the Hamburg for the weekend with a friend. So in the interpretive reading, they have to figure out what they want to do on this weekend. So they're given authentic selections from theater listings, restaurant descriptions, and other activities in the city. And they read through those and answer comprehension questions, genre recognition questions, keywords, guessing meaning from context. And at the end of all of that, they're supposed to make a plausible plan for the weekend. What are they going to do when? They do this in, we do this in class, so it takes up an entire 50 minute lesson. And importantly, the um, interpretive reading guide is written in English. So they're reading the text in German, but answering the questions about the text in English. Then they move on to the interpersonal communication phase. So again, they have already, at the end of the interpretive, they created a plan for what they wanted to do. And then we go into the computer lab, and they are paired with a partner who has already also come up with their own plan about what they want to do. And now they have to get together and negotiate one single plan because they're going to be with their buddy the entire weekend in Hamburg. So they work through this in a conversation. It's done in the computer lab. Again, and it's, we record that. And then the final phase is the presentational writing phase where now, okay, you went to Hamburg, you came back now. I want you to write a blog post about how your weekend went. What did you do? When did you do it? Why did you do it? Was it a really exciting trip? Was it a really horrible trip? We try to get them to be creative. Um, and just like all of our other sort of essays that we do in German 1002, they're done in class the first draft and they get feedback. And then the second draft is done at home and we really encourage them now to take the time to make it, into, make it look like a blog post. Change your fonts, add pictures. I've seen students Photoshop themselves into pictures of Hamburg. And they can get really creative with this and at the end they have a very nice finished product of the things that they've been working on. Now what I skipped over in talking about that was sort of how we work in the feedback and grading. Um, the 
after the students do the interpretive reading day in class, the instructors take it, the reading guides home and grade them. If you got the handout that was on the back table, if you didn't, maybe you can hand some out. There is, I think it's actually got a little out of order. So the second page is the interpretive rubric. So the instructors grade them. And that's just to give you a sense of what it's like. They grade them according to that rubric. And then about four to five days later or so, we have what we call the interpretive feedback day. And this is, again, another 50-minute period that we devote to this. And the instructors will hand back the comprehension guides, <coughs> go through any tricky areas where students stumbled, get everyone on the same page. And then we um, work through some group activities that are designed to help bridge the gap between where they were talking about it in English on the interpretive to now they're going to need to talk about all of this in German when they go into the interpersonal. So we do a lot of activities getting them to talk about it in German. We also brainstorm things like conversation fillers, helpful phrases for beginning and ending a conversation, asking for clarification, all things they're going to need when they do the interpersonal. And then the interpersonal communication task is the very next day, ideally, and we've been able to get this because that way it's all fresh in their mind. And further, they have a warm up in the computer lab on that day where they just are really asking very specific questions and answering specific questions, the things that might come up in their conversations, and they can kind of practice in a very controlled environment before we set them loose. And that seems to kind of help. Again, this is German 1002. Um, so when they're in the computer lab, they record their conversation, and then we actually have them self-assess on their about their conversation so they listen to the first two minutes of the recording and rate themselves now I think it's the first page in your handouts they rate themselves on that exact rubric there that's labeled interpersonal communication and as you see at the bottom there's a space to write in comments on their strengths or areas for improvement so we encourage them to think about what did you feel like you did well at what do you feel like you want to work on some more and then they turn those rubrics in and instructors grade them using the exact same rubric and that could be kind of nice because you can see how much you agree or disagree with your students, but it also allows you to tailor your comments very specifically to what your students are thinking about themselves. Kind of makes it easier, at least for myself. Um, about a week later, so again, this instructor has to go home and listen to these at home. About a week later, then they hand that back and usually just discuss some general tendencies that they noted in all of the conversations point out that students are going to be at varying levels and that's okay and then talk a little bit again this is 10.02 so we talk a little bit about expectations for the second year what does it mean to be an intermediate speaker where are you shooting for and then that's usually when we hand out the presentational writing test that third and final part and maybe work a little bit on focus on form activities with reviewing the past tense because up to now it's been in present tense now they got to take it to the past tense um, and so just looking overall in German the rubrics that we use and I also, the last rubric you have is the one for the essay. It looks a little different. The other rubrics were taken and have been tweaked from the IPA, the actual IPA handbook. The final rubric is a little different because it's based on something we've been using for essays for a while. Uh, but they look pretty similar across 1001 through German 1003. And 1001 and 1002 <coughs> and 1022, we just have one IPA per semester. It's roughly 20 to 25 percent of the grade, and in German 1003, which Beth will talk a little bit more about in a minute, they have two IPAs that are for a total of 50 percent of the grade. So another thing to think about is then why would we choose a weekend in Hamburg? How did we come to pick this content? And originally it actually came from an idea that I had from um, Francis Mato Schultz in Spanish 1022, and then it also really fit very well with a specific topic of a chapter that we're doing, which is the chapter of the chapters, what can one do in a city? And so it uses a lot of the vocabulary and structures that they have just been learning. We have at times, so it starts sort of towards the end of that chapter. It reviews a lot of the vocabulary they just learned, plus reviews old vocabulary with time phrases, food. It requires students to use two-way prepositions that take two different cases to talk about going to a place or being at a place. They just learned this. It requires them to order their time, manner, and place phrases, which is done differently than in English, something else they've just been learning. And then they have to put every, it all together with stuff they've learned in the past, modal verbs, past tense, subordinating conjunctions, all of that. So they use a lot of what they've learned up to that point. It's also extremely important, though, to have a cultural piece. And I feel like our first two versions of this IPA didn't quite have that strongly enough. Um, so this last time this semester, we added a little bit more about what we had activities that were some were open on Sundays, most were not open on Sunday. 
And then we could talk about, well, why are so many things closed on Sundays? Because, of course, that's a little bit different in Germany than it is here. Um, so that you have to work in the cultural somewhere. And I also would encourage you to think about the entire curriculum um, and what tasks they're doing on this IPA and how that relates to other tasks they're doing on other IPAs. For example, in 1001, they do a presentational speaking task, and in 1002, they do a presentational writing task. So they're getting a little bit of different things. And finally, you have this beautiful IPA. Well, now you've got to get your students excited about it. And that was something we were also sort of struggling with. So this semester, we kind of went on the day when I hand out the overview and I talk to them like I just talked to you about what we're going to be doing, how this is going to work. Then I go a little bit into, but OK, why, why can't I just take another test? Why do we have to do this thing? And so I talk a little bit about the differences between a fill-in-the-blank test and an IPA where a fill-in-the-blank test measures discrete, explicit knowledge about vocabulary, grammar, and culture, test basic reading and listening comprehension. You study a bunch the night before, cram it all in there, and then hopefully you remember it, but maybe you forget some of it. Whereas an IPA is a little different. It takes a snapshot of your performance in this language at, the point, at this point in time. It asks what you can do with the language in a real world situation. <laughs> and sure, you can prepare by reviewing some vocabulary, some structures, but there's not that cramming that you have otherwise. And then I like to compare it to an analogy to think about driving. So in driving, if you're going to get a license, you have to test, take a driver's written test, which tests your explicit knowledge about the laws and rules of driving a car. But it doesn't say anything about how you drive the car out in the real world. And then you would take a driving test that looks at your performance as a driver, but only indirectly assesses your knowledge of rules and laws. And in order to get that license, you have to pass both of these tests. It's not going to happen. And in the language, is sort of similar. You want to be able to do both. You want to have solid, explicit knowledge about the language and good performance in the real world. But of course, some people are going to be more skilled in one area than in other areas, just as they would be in driving. Some people, we all know drivers who know all the rules, but are actually pretty horrible drivers. And we also all know the rule that we're supposed to come to a full, complete stop at a stop sign. But do you all do it every single time? <laughs> Probably not. So ideally, you want to have sufficient skills in both areas. But you might be better in one, the theory, one area than the other, and that's OK. And then finally, we, we had gotten a lot of feedback and complaints from the students. Well, this takes like two weeks, and what am I actually learning? I'm not learning anything by doing this. Well, so we said, OK, yes, you are learning things. It's more practice with the things that we are learning. And at this point is when I go through, like I just went through with you very explicitly. This is the thing. These are the vocabulary. These are the structures you're going to be using that you're going to be reviewing. This is all stuff you've learned. You need to practice more with those. This is putting it all together now, not just, you know, here's modal verbs, and here's this. Now you put it all together. That's a challenging task. So you are learning how to do that. But then we also have to remind them it is an assessment, and so it should be taken seriously, because again, it's worth 20 to 25 percent of their grade. And sometimes they need that reminder as well. OK, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Beth Kautz, who will take it from here. Thank you. All right. So um, I am the coordinator and I teach for German 1003. And we began using IPAs a year ago fall. So we're in our fourth semester of doing two IPAs in the semester. And um, one thing I wanted to point out, a difference that I think you'll hear when we switch to our Spanish instructors, is that in German, every section is doing the IPA. So every instructor. Um, needed to do this and I think in Spanish you had pilot sections so that is an important um, difference I think and so one of the things that I want to talk about is what the instructors think <laughs> and this kind of says it all but I will um, elaborate a bit um, so they uh, particularly the experienced instructors are initially quite skeptical and I'm looking out here and you are the experienced instructors. 
And so you know that you have been teaching for a long time and you know that you, you try to do all the right things and you've done things and you've had success in the last 20 years, so why do you have to do it differently? And what was wrong with what I was doing before? And why is this better? And aren't we already doing that? And how am I supposed to do this if I'm teaching three classes? And so there's a lot of resistance to change. And it doesn't matter how wonderful or progressive or innovative the idea is, initially there's the resistance. And, and, and that's hard to deal with, especially when you're the one who's going, let's do this. And it's really hard when you're telling them, we're all doing this. Um, so, so we kind of had a lot of, uh, lot of unhappy people the first year, a lot of people tearing their hair out, because also we were experimenting and weren't quite sure how to do it. And so at the end of last year, we had a big feedback meeting with all the inst German instructors, and we had a lot of good ideas generated, how to do the feedback, how to space it out, how many to do, how much time between the IPAs, um, what the rubric should look like. And, and what came out of that is that ultimately, the teachers really wanted to support the idea of doing these IPAs. They wanted to be on board with it. And we had to figure out a way together to make it work. Um, and so I want to share with you some of the, the most problematic areas that we experienced and how we ended up resolving them. Um, so in, in looking at the three parts of the IPA, the first two, the interpersonal and the presentational, we didn't have that much uh, negative feedback on those. The interpersonal um, is quite similar to things we've been doing before. We'd already been recording role plays in, in the DIL. One thing that was different was the rubric. And the rubric was much more detailed and narrative, as you see um, there. And one of the changes was moving to a little bit more bullet point. It's not completely bullet point, but we broke up some of those, took out some words so that it was just a little bit easier to read. But that was, that was one, of the, one of the things there. With the presentational, again, that was very similar um, to what we'd been doing. A little bit what was different is this idea that they should be incorporating things that they learned in the other parts. So this expectation that the presentational writing um, has, meaning, has more culturally relevant and meaningful content, that, that that upped the ante on that. The interpretive is where we got a lot of people with some very big concerns about what was going on there. So why? What was the concern with the interpretive assessment? It got right down to, what does this look like? What are we assessing? Um, and so we didn't have, so moving from true-false questions to maybe one personal response at the end, it moved to this comprehension guide with vocabulary, with um, inferencing, with cultural comparisons, with talking about the author's perspective. And whoa, that was very different than what we had been doing before. On the actual um, interpersonal guide, you'll notice that we have literal comprehension and interpretive comprehension. And I think that's really the key of what was different, is that most of the time we really focus on the literal comprehension and picking out those details and really kind of working bottom up. And with this interpretive, we're asking students to do more top-down um, analysis as well as pushing them to bring in that cultural piece much more strongly than they had before. So that was <coughs> one concern. Another concern was the language. And Helena mentioned that um, it's in English. And, and this is one of the things with the IPAs that uh, they talk about maybe doing English in the earlier phases, moving to the, na to the target language later on. This was a change for us, though because um, we had been testing everything in German in the past. And so 
And this is a debate that goes beyond IPAs, so I'm not going to get into it a whole bunch. But in terms of uh, feedback from our instructors, this, this came to be an issue as well. And then the grading of it. How do I grade these free form responses in English? I'm used to grading either a true false or maybe something they wrote in German and I can give them some credit for it because they had the subject verb right. Uh, you know, we did a lot of grading part content, part, part grammar. But if it's a free form English, how am I supposed to do that? And a lot of people feel very um, nervous and uncomfortable because it's not the kind of grading they're used to. But it's certainly grading that one can expect at a university. That's really the kind of grading that happens in most humanities courses. Um, and so there was this sense of how do I know if it's right or wrong? How do I work with this rubric? Um, and so that there was, there was some tension there as well. So what happened? We discovered gaps. We discovered two kinds of gaps, particularly. One is what we were do, what the assessment was, and how we were preparing students for that, or what we were doing in our instruction. But the second gap was equally as important, and I think that we noticed that there was a gap between what we knew were best practices, and all those things we learned a long time ago, and on our good days, we do it, but we often forget them and they fall by the wayside when we're in our day to day teaching. And so it's pointed to some of those gaps. So, how were we going to get back on track? We went back to the idea of backward design and particularly getting from two to three. How do we get from the assessment to what we're doing in the classroom? And a lot of this went, goes into the idea of learning strategies. Um, so these are things of what we wanted to do with the students then to, to help prepare them. So I, going back to pre-reading strategies, you know, identifying, skimming and scanning, identifying the genre, who wrote this article, who might be its intended audience, why might this person have written this article? Those are the good days, you know? But many times we get down to, what time does the movie start? And, and that's where we end up focusing. So thinking back to what are those three reading. And so in our existing materials, adding some of those questions back in, or if they aren't there in the book to begin with, adding them in. So adding um, to existing text. Another thing is in the post-reading, Pushing more towards that critical thinking, moving beyond the very personal response so that we can begin to hypothesize, generalize about the culture, and, and get into more comparisons. In 1001, um, Helena took it in a little bit different direction, um, where they actually have dedicated days in a syllabus for what they're calling focus strategy projects. And so there'll be a day when they're really working on reading strategies. And so they'll have four texts, and they do very concentrated practice with the types of activities they would be doing on the IPA. So let's try to find the supporting details. Let's look for those keywords. Um, and so it's really teaching them to do that, and that's, so that's really great at the 1001 level. We're hoping then by the time we get up to 1003, when we, we, when we invoke those ideas, they remember them. But we have to invoke them. That's part of the issue. We have to keep bringing it to the students. And finally, um, this idea of backward design, I want to bring back to weekly teacher meetings. And I know not many, not all departments do this, but in, in German we do. And so how are the instructors working together to make this happen? And so going through the action, each, so the way we're trying, trying to do it in 10.03 is we have the assessment, 
And we all do it at home, and we bring it to our meeting, and we compare our answers, and we share our ideas. And that helps from the first place to come up with what are the possible answers, what are different points of view, and that kind of preps us for the discussion we're going to have in class with our students as well. Um, it, it helps us anticipate what, where, what answers might, how they might fit with the rubric. And we don't go through and necessarily say this is right and this is wrong, but we're, we're coming together to a sense of the norms of what we expect from the students. Um, so it's, there's a lot of anxiety with instructors to get this new thing and go home and they're sitting there and they have to grade it. So really walking through it together um, is important. That's what I Let's see, is that okay? Hi, I'm Liz Lake, and I'm gonna talk about our IPA pilot in Spanish 1003. We did a green project. Um, and the photograph you see here is a picture of um, the Madrid-Rio park system in Madrid, Spain, and it looms large in our IPA. Um, as I mentioned, it was a pilot, so it was a little bit different. Um, we ran four sections of the IPA, only one IPA um, in each class. Um, in fall 2015 with two different instructors teaching. Um, in spring 2016, this past February, we ran it again in four sections, but this time um, we had three different instructors teaching it. So Angela, who is the coordinator of the class, taught it. I taught it, and one of our graduate students taught it as well. Um, the IP itself took four instructional days out of our regular course calendar. And like German, we spread it out over two weeks. Um, it was delivered in class on a Wednesday and Thursday in both cases. Um, and it replaced, in our curriculum, two course readings, um, one listening activity, and two informal writing assignments. So that's kind of how we fit it in. The first, and all of the overview that I'm gonna give you right now relates to this student guide that we give to the students. And after I've gone over um, our IPA. I'm also going to talk about a survey that we administered to the students to get their feedback of their impression of the IPA. So first we'll talk about the IPA itself. We started with some warm-up activities and in the warm-up activities um, the day before the interpretive mode started <coughs> the students watched a video about the Madrid Rio project on Moodle and then they took a short quiz and the purpose of the video was to get the students to wrap their minds around the scope of this green project because it is enormous. And we wanted them to have an idea of what that project was like before they read about it. Um, second, it also previewed a lot of the vocabulary that they were going to see in the reading the following day. So for you guys to wrap your minds around the project, I have a before and after picture. Um, basically, a highway ran along the Rio Manzanares, which basically um, bisects Madrid, and it cut off the two sides of the city. And so this project submerged the highway underground, put it in tunnels, and reclaimed the surfaces along the banks of the river as park system. Okay, so it's a huge idea. We wanted to make sure they got that when they were looking at the brochure they read about it. Okay, um, day one is the interpretive mode. It took a 50-minute class period. Um, the students read a brochure, and actually I have some if you want to take a look at it, a brochure about Madrid Rio. And this comes from the municipality's um, website, so it's an actual brochure, authentic text. Um, students complete the comprehension guide, and unlike our friends in German, we have questions both in English and Spanish. So students are ans answering questions about main ideas, they're making inferences, I think the inferences they did in Spanish, author's perspective, the, the things you typically see on a comprehension guide. Um, in terms of the feedback loop, the first time that we did this, Angela, because she taught three sections with the IPA, encountered um, the if difficulty of maintaining that feedback loop and getting those um, comprehension guides back to the students before they started interpersonal mode. So Mandy had a great idea. 
why not take some of the day where you would um, begin the interpersonal mode and, have, and go over those comprehension guides together and have the students grade them? And it was actually, it was wonderful. It opened up this meta conversation about reading strategies and, and students would fight for their answers. And so it really did open up a really beautiful discussion and it helped the instructor because it maintained the feedback loop. The students got feedback, but the instructor had the weekend to finish grading. And I found when I looked back um, over my section's uh, comprehension guides that they were, they were pretty on. Um, and I want to show you this too. So this is what we projected for the students. Um, thanks to our colleagues in German, we learned the trick of embedding the rubric into the comprehension guide itself. So the rubric for each section is underneath each section. Um, and then for this question, it was inferences. The students answered in Spanish. These are actual students' responses cleaned up a little bit. So you see high frequency verbs um, like to want and to have and things like that. Simple sentences, a couple complex sentences, maybe compound. Um, and I think that's good to show them what they write. Not for me to write my model answer, which is going to be much better than theirs, right? Um, and like I said, it was a really fruitful um, half of a class period going over this. So then the next day, which is a Thursday, was the interpersonal mode. As homework the night before, after they did the interpretive mode, the students brainstormed ideas for a green project. And the green project could be large scale, like the crazy Madrid Rio, or it could be small scale, recycling in the dorms. Um, and they had to come up with ideas and bring those ideas to class um, on Thursday. We went to the Dill Lab and they recorded an eight minute conversation where they shared their ideas and negotiated which one they wanted to work on to create a presentation or poster session. Um, at the end of recording, students had the opportunity to listen to themselves again. So you have that self-assessment going on. Um, and again, with the feedback loop, it's about two hours for the instructor per 25 students to listen to the recordings. Here is an example of the rubric that we use for the self-assessment of the interpersonal mode. Um, some of it is borrow borrowed from the BASA materials for Spanish 1004. It has a very simple scale, um, three to one. Three, I did this well. Two, I can do this. One, I need to work on this. And it's looking at the same things that we are looking at as instructors when we assess their speaking. So it's language function, text type, communication strategy, strategies, comprehensibility, and language control, okay? And again, having the students look at it first gets immediate feedback while it buys the instructor some time to give the other um, feedback. All right, so the poster day happens on days three and four, which are the following week on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, it takes place over two 50-minute class periods. Um, the students prepare six-minute um, poster board or PowerPoint presentations detailing their um, green project. And the presentation is broken down into four minutes of actual explaining what their project is and two minutes of question and answer session with their classmates. Um, again, the students have an opportunity to complete a self-assessment. And again, very similar to the one I just showed you for the interpersonal mode. And then the feedback loop, I find it very easy to take my notes while they're presenting. And then maybe a half an hour after class, I can finish those up and give them back the next Monday in class. Um, so the grading is manageable. But I wanted to explain a little bit about how um, the presentations work, because it's kind of like a round robin. Um, we have two rounds during that 50 minute class period. So in the first round, three pairs, so we have three pairs, so there's a pair sitting here, a pair sitting here, a pair sitting there, and they all do their six minute presentations. Okay, as soon as they're done, then they move to the next table. Okay, the rest of the class stays still, I stay still, and they just move around. The okay, presenters. the presenters move around and they give the presentation again. And then they do it a third time and then they're done. Round two, three new pairs present, right? As soon as they're done, they go around the room again. Okay, and again, this was Manny's idea. <laughs> um, so it's a very effective way to get all of the presentations in during two class periods for the instructor to see all of the presentations. Um, and it works much better, I must say, in Falwell where we have bigger classrooms. Um, I, we didn't cult off this semester. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> we were in tight quarters and it got very loud. Okay, um, really quickly, so I can give Angela some time too, 
I want to talk about the student surveys that we administered. So the surveys themselves were administered after the IPA, IPA was completed through a Google um, form. And um, we had 12 interval scale questions with strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Um, there was one question about um, IPA topic preferences for the future, so what of the themes from our textbook would the students be interested in completing an IPA about? Um, so we looked at that. Um, there was one short answer question, what other comments do you have regarding the IPA? Suggestions for improvement, what you liked, etc. And then, unfortunately, <laughs> only 52 of 92, 97 students responded. But the good news is, is of those 52 students, the feedback about the IPA was very positive. So let's take a little bit closer look at some of that. Um, so one of the questions was, the IPA activities were a worthwhile use of class time. So here we have 42 students out of 50, um, 42 out of 52, right? 42 out of 52 saying that it was a um, good use of class time. So that is really good evidence that it's worthwhile. Um, and this is a question that I love, and I love that the response was so overwhelmingly positive. I had a deeper understanding of the IPA chapter themes as a result of the IPA. So in this case, we have 47 of 52 saying that's the case. And this is what we want, right? <laughs> and the other thing I like about it, um, actually, I always think of Elaine and um, the story she tells about the teacher who was asked, what do you teach? And she says, I teach from the textbook. And in my own teaching, I find so much, and I think this goes back to what Beth was saying, how on a good day we do it all right, but some days we don't, um, that I find myself trying to contextualize the grammar. And what the beauty of the IPA is, is that the context, the grammar and the language grows out of the context. And it's so much more natural, it's so much more authentic and real. So I loved seeing this response. Um, what else? Uh, and again, what do we have? 36 students, or 39 students said that we should use, strongly agreed or agreed to use the IPAs in future classes. Here are some comments that the students wrote. I liked everything regarding IPA. It helped me to recognize the area I needed to improve in and what areas I was strong in to give me confidence. It also made learning about something I wouldn't normally be interested in fun. I will also see in my experience with the two sections I've taught, um, the IPA created a sense of camaraderie in the classroom, and I noticed that their um, participation in all class discussions just exploded. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's two sections, but that was my experience. Um, as much as I liked this project, I felt as though everyone talked about the same topic, i.e. recycling. Maybe suggest different topics and groups um, can sign up for the topic of their choice in order to get a diverse group of projects. Great feedback from the students. Um, overall, I liked the IPA activity because it was different from the everyday Spanish class and allowed for a different approach to a learning a language. Smart, insightful student, um, which I think is very important. And then I thought the entire project as a whole was very fun and interesting. Okay, so we got some really good feedback. I think it shows us that this is really a worthwhile endeavor to see how we can incorporate it into um, the classes. And um, I think from there I'll let Angela take over. Sure. A few minutes, um, if you want to oh, I have to give you this okay. too. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for all together. All right, put this on. Great. And so the PowerPoint, Liz, is at the bottom. Okay. Fancy clip. Okay. The PowerPoint is here. This is Carla presentation. Is this yours, Liz, this one right here? Oh. Yeah, I'm just wondering which one it is. Okay. Great. Okay, I have some of the output um, that came from this project that Liz designed. Um, it was integrated very well into the syllabus and worked. Um, for 75 students, the first time through, it was a lot more work than I had imagined, and doing the grading in class was a lot easier um, when we got the um, reading guide to get done. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of what the outcome was for the students. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples in the interpretive guide, uh, the writing samples based on the reading about Madrid Rio, 
um, interpersonal. If I can get that up here quickly, um, I will have you listen to some of the oral um, chat that the two students had and the presentational. I might put the interpersonal at the end just um, so I can keep the flow going instead of getting in and out and into the language center. So here's an example of some of the writing. Um, as Beth had mentioned, you know, the idea of the integrated performance assessment, we're working with other skills. We are bringing in interpretive, how do you interpret a reading, you're going to present something and you're going to chat about it. And we're trying to incorporate these things in a more natural way. The cultures, the comparisons, connections and communities. Ours as far as the, the culture, this is an actual project that happened in um, Spain. It was one of the largest in Europe. It was quite monumental, cost um, millions, billions, zillions of dollars. I don't know how much, but they were very worried at one point economically how this would impact the country. Um, but the people in Spain have really enjoyed it and, um, and are enjoying it every day. So let's take a look at what the students produced. We had some questions in English, some questions in Spanish. Um, here the question was in English, but they had to respond in Spanish. So there were small excerpts, and again, um, grammar isn't as important, but I thought it was really interesting how they made connections. Remember, they just saw video the night before, had 50 minutes to do this in class. So it was pretty fast paced. Um, so the question, as Liz had posed it, how does the Madrid Rio compare or contrast to park systems or green projects that you know of in the U.S.? Um, here says they want to um, clean the rivers more than Flint, Michigan, that's for sure, <laughs> where things are contaminated. Um, uh, the green zones are pretty, just like the parks in Washington, D.C., so we're comparing another city. Um, I think that the national parks in the United States are better, of course. I don't know why, but other people didn't think they were as good. But here we have you know, three comparisons of what's going on in the US, in the United States. Parks are very different than Madrid, Rio. Um, but in Minneapolis, we have small parks in the city. In New York, they have Central Park that's similar um, because a Central Park, and this of course, I loved it because it was vocabulary that they got from the reading. Here it says they have pasarelas. Uh, something about ciclistas. So they're using the grammar that they got. Again, in 50 minutes, they were able to call words. We don't use pasarelas very often um, in our teacher speak. Here's a third one, comparing cultural perspectives. Um, Madrid Rio is more aggressive. It was an aggressive project because it's very big. Um, it's the biggest one that I've heard about in the United States. Also, projects in the United States do not try to preserve um, historical monuments. That was very interesting because in Madrid they brought in some monuments from like the 1500s. It was from you know King whoever, um, and they got that that we just kind of demolished, especially in Minneapolis. Um, and so I thought that was very interesting that and insightful that they were able to um, get this out in 50 minutes. These are not all A students, by the way. I just grabbed the ones that I see more interested, not for the grammar. The second um, personal reaction and. Um, this was not graded, but because they did the grading, I was able to give my two cents at this last question. Um, and the first time we piloted, my students were like, where are my points? How come there's no rubric here? What's going on? I'm like, well, because there's not. I'm done. Um, but here, they didn't care if they got points because they figured out the points. And here I'm giving them some feedback. So what's your personal reaction? Using specific information, describe your personal reaction to the article. What are reasons connected to your own experience? So here they're saying Madrid Rio is a good example for everyone in the world, everyone. Um, it changed, again, the grammar isn't so important. It changed, it, it's a place with a lot of opportunities. They have biking, they have walking, they have water sports, they have a whole bunch of things. Um, the article, so I'm really glad the student went back. Besides, the article describes the place, the monumental place, or the monuments, and the new icons, los nuevos iconos, que impactan, you know, how does it impact the people in Madrid? So it really got to the heart of the article there. And they're probably scratching this out at, you know, 48 minutes, the last question. I think it's um, very interesting, it's important. And again, I don't care if they use the past subjunctive, but if I were to live in Spain, I would be very thrilled about the project. It's important to have green spaces in large cities, and then the person goes back, well, where I used to live when I was a child, I'm like, wow, this is really advanced thinking, not just the grammar. Um, in the city where I used to live when I was a child, there are a lot of parks and lakes and places for exercise. But the city is small, and there's not a lot of space. So um, it really activated that 
thinking. And the last one, I think the article is interesting because the name of activities that the project literally um, is bringing together. The, and here we go, Liz, her pictures, the before and after. So you see students were looking at your stuff and they saw how ugly it might have been before and how it was afterwards. Um, and they're talking about the Rio Manzanares. Um, and also I mentioned when I lived in Spain, um, I lived close to that where they did the construction and I would go home and I'd blow my nose and everything was like, oh, what is that? So they've really taken the contamination out of it. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip your listening. Um, I'm sorry, we had the oral exchange, but I wanted to show you these beautiful visual projects. So if you wanna listen to my oral exchange, you can um, do that later. So these are some of the projects and we'll leave a few minutes for um, questions. I cleaned up a little bit of the grammar. So clean the Mississippi, the urban project, clean the water, geothermal energy, flower power, and small gardens. Um, this is one about cleaning the Mississippi, talking about problems, um, what's going on today, what's gonna happen in the future. And I was extremely impressed with how the students used the future tense. I only took pictures of the handmade stuff. I didn't really, not that I didn't care about the PowerPoints, but I thought these students deserved um, my extra input because they went above and beyond, drawing and pasting and putting stuff together. Um, this is the urban project. And again, those letters are all hand cut out. What's the description of their project? The green aspects and the effects. What I liked about this, besides it was visually interesting, is it didn't have a lot of text. So they couldn't just read from it. They had to maybe look at the bullet points and extrapolate, which they did well. Uh, limpia la agua, this is a very common grammar mistake, but it's okay. I'm not gonna be concerned that they put la agua instead of el agua. Um, very basic, but these two students did a great job of explaining each of their images. Recycling, what's the day on your calendar? You've got this rain garden, you've got barrels for water. So um, they really went into it. And this group, I was just so impressed. This student is from New London, which has you know fewer than like 10,000 people. In her church, they started with this project for geothermal energy, and the church is on the right, and then it went to the school. I mean, they are really advanced in Lou London, I guess. They are just rolling out this geothermal project. Um, what are the green, and she talked about what's going on in Malaysia, that they have green projects around the world using geothermal, and I was just completely impressed by these two students. Um, I'm talking about something that was real that happened in her hometown. So she was really excited. This, I guess, is from Barcelona, where um, they have put um, flowers on top of buses. So you know how we're using um, techos verdes? We have like green roofs. Well, I guess in Barcelona, they are uh, techos ambulantes. They are like moving around roofs on top of buses. Um, but these flowers cannot be too tall. They have to be short tall. You know, we can't have sunflowers there. Um, but what is good about it? Um, what happens? And then people want to take the bus. I'm on this bus. It's got flowers on the top. So very interesting. Um, again, it didn't matter if the students were the strongest students, but they really got their feet wet. And then this would be one to um, get going in uh, the U of M dorms to create community with the students. They're going to plant this small little garden in their dorm room. And so my students brought in, it's just a, um, a liter pop container. They cut it off and then they put the seed in there and then they're gonna grow and um, I just thought it was great. What's the problem? What are the green elements? What is the positive impact? And tell me about the project. So in the sake of time, I went over a minute. I'm very sorry. Um, so if you have questions, um, you can let us know. Um, if you wanna stick around, I'm sorry that we went over your time, but that's how it worked in um, Spanish 10 of three.
Because in these Spanish, we talk about having to cut stuff out to fit the right. IP. And we did cut out certain IP. We did how we did to it. The other things that we cut out to make it fit into that So not so much in the tests themselves, but in the other things we were doing. And some of them, like you said, Beth, because of these, we were doing very similar, so we just kind of folded them together mm -hmm. into the IPA. And then didn't have this standalone anymore. Um, I'll pick up on that and ask if you guys attract anybody to see about a PPP performance, do you are you prepared to say there's any factor? It would just be starting now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because there's so much more that goes into it for town for. Right. So yeah. it would be interesting to see if you are seeing this kind of program pilot and how we can change the Well, like I said, um, one of the outgrowths that I saw was increased oral participation in class and a, a willingness to participate more in class because they knew each other better and because they presented early on in the semester, that type of thing. I just want to thank you all for presenting the messiness, right? Because <laughs> it, it being very real, but I think what really struck me is how, and it sounds to me, both the students and, and the instructors are seeing the value behind it and seeing kind of going back to what are our goals and what do we want to be teaching and not letting the textbook dominate everything we do in the classroom and so I just want to thank you for being real. <laughs> thank you.